Hey guys, Drifter here. Today I'm going to be playing Call of Duty World War II while talking about Bigfoot and the Loch Ness Monster. We're going to be talking about cryptozoology, pseudoscience, psychics, cryptids, and all sorts of interesting things like that. And before you begin to wonder if I'm totally off my rocker or if the devil's lettuce has permanently damaged my brain, remember that this video is about skeptical reasoning. You know, like critical thinking, science, eyewitness trustworthiness, and things like that. Bigfoot and Nessie are perfect examples of this this because they are almost by design, even accidentally, going to shortcut our critical thinking. They both very strongly rely on heuristics and our human biases, and the more aware we are of those heuristics and biases, the smarter decisions we can make in our day-to-day -day lives, and I'm going to kind of pick these two myths apart as good examples of those biases. Also, it's going to be more of a personal video to me because one of the reasons that I got into science and data and research and all of that kind of stuff is because I watched a lot of videos about Bigfoot and Nessie growing up and it was a big part of my childhood development. I literally grew up on this kind of nonsense. Let's roll back the time to 1995 with a little eight-year-old drifter who stays up late to watch shows on TV. And I used to watch this TV show called Sightings that would come on after the news on Fox and what was interesting interesting about it is that yes, it definitely was one of those kind of shows on Fox, but it came on after the news and it was professionally produced and it sort of had this newsy kind of feel to it, well, after you got past this intro. At that point, it started to appear. They had large, dark eyes, claw-like hands. I began sensing and knowing and feeling. I do believe in life after death. I mean, I've been there. We have not scratched the surface of what the mind can do. It's a connection with the unknown. The rest of the show had a host and a presenter, and it felt kind of legitimate, at least to an eight-year-old, you know. Maybe this is one of the reasons that my parents wanted to put me in special education, but maybe they should have taught me some critical reasoning instead, because these kinds of things legitimately fooled me as a kid, and I see that some adults and teenagers and college students all make these same kinds of mistakes, maybe not about Bigfoot or the Loch Ness Monster, but the same sort of heuristical shortcuts and thinking that lead to very strange things. I also had some biases on this because as a kid when I grew up I watched a lot of scary movies and as you've seen from the ghost story episodes I saw a lot of ghosts and crazy stuff, though that was probably due to the medication I was taking and extreme isolation from other people which can do weird things, but for me this was all very very real. The two stories in this whole field of weird paranormal stuff that I latched onto the most were Bigfoot and the Loch Ness Monster. For some reason, it was especially the Loch Ness Monster, and for me, Nessie was real up until I was like 13 or 14. Right about the time I hit a teenager, I got kind of smart enough to realize that was nonsense, but as a younger kid, it was really, really real, and there were adults that were on board with this train, too. These two are also fascinating to me now as an adult because they were plausible, provable, and testable in areas where as ghosts and supernatural and psychics and stuff really kind of weren't. And even as a kid, I knew that and I thought that like, well, you know, if somebody can find a Bigfoot, we can really crack open this whole like paranormal thing. And I actually at one point wanted to grow up to be a professional cryptozoologist or a ghost hunter at one point. I don't know, for some reason, nine-year-old me thought that those were real professions. But um, let's jump back to the topic at hand and talk about why people actually believe in Bigfoot and Nessie. For Bigfoot and Nessie, you have a ton of pictures of these two, and videos, mind you. There's lots of pictures of gorillas in the woods, and lots of pictures of strange things in the water. They're always a bit blurry, and nobody really expects to find a monster, especially in these old pictures, so you kind of forgive them for the really rushed and goofy-looking pictures. They have a basis in known creatures of some kind. Bigfoot is an ape. We've all seen apes. We know that apes can be real. And we know that Nessie is some sort of prehistoric monster, which at one point definitely was real, or an eel or another strange sea creature, and we, most of us don't know that much about the deep sea, so we're like, eh, you know, it can kind of be anything. On top of that, they all live in an area that's difficult to study, Bigfoot being all of the Pacific Northwest, Yetis being in Nepal, and very few foreigners with cameras up until recently, that is, could go there, and uh, Nessie or other lake monsters being in super deep, dark, muddy lakes that are just difficult to determine anything about. Even locals, you just can't see very far into the 
the water. And finally, there's some historical accounts that most people find interesting. Indians have stories about Bigfoots dating back thousands of years, and even St. Columbia saw Nessie at Loch Ness in the year 1500. So given this kind of information, it's easy to be like, well, you know, there's something out there. We've got pictures of things, and they look like things I've seen, and we can't really study it that well, and we've got historical accounts, so you know, there might be something out there. Or depending on the leaps of logic that you're comfortable with, it might be something more like, well, you know, there's definitely something out there. But this preys on a deeply rooted biological design for human beings to avoid danger, because these two, and other things like ghosts and UFOs and psychics and whatnot, are perceived as inherently bigger, stronger, more mysterious, sneakier than us, and dangerous. A Bigfoot could walk up behind you and break your neck like a gorilla. It could pick you up by your arm and fling you around and pull you apart. You could take a swim in Loch Ness and get eaten by a giant prehistoric beast, kind of like a shark, or a killer whale, or a, uh, I don't think giant squids really attack people, but all of these other sea monsters that we know are really real. Because of that, we tend to like to avoid danger. It's one of the reasons that we as human beings don't like being in the dark. We remember bad news, we share bad news quickly, we avoid unfamiliar things. We are evolutionarily, biologically, or if you want to do the divine creator created, designed to avoid danger. On top of that, all of these evidences that are presented rely heavily on human heuristics that we use to navigate our daily life, some of them very old and some of them are very new. We'll do the new one first, such as, well, as we know, the camera doesn't lie, right? Uh, we see a video of something, we know that thing is real, we watch uh, Logan Paul and Drama Alert and TMZ, and we see what celebrities do, and context doesn't matter, setting up doesn't matter, Photoshop, Adobe After Effects for some people doesn't matter. We just believe that cameras are inherently real, and of course a ton of these images are faked. I'll do the Loch Ness Monster one super quick because that's easy for me. This is the most famous photo of the monster, the thing that really started it all, and when you look at it, old, black and white, blurry, whatever, you can say, all right, you know, there's something in the water, it's probably not a toy submarine, but when you look at the original version, Oh man, that is a lot less impressive, and you can definitely tell that those are waves. <laughs> those are not big waves, those are little ripples in the water. Or one that I showed earlier of this weird eel-like thing is actually just a couple of otters playing and having some fun, just in a funny pose. Another one that I showed early of a mysterious hump seemingly uh, swimming through the water in a certain direction has a different photo associated with it of a guy putting that hump in very shallow water. He just made it out of leather and colored it and stuck it in the ground. And yeah, that's kind of how you make a monster. When it comes to Bigfoot, if you zoom in very closely on the famous Patterson footage, you'll see that it's actually Pepe the Frog. As mentioned early, there is a familiarity concept to this. If apes are real, and we know that monkeys are real, then why not Bigfoot? Why couldn't Bigfoot just be an undiscovered type of ape? Why couldn't it just hide in the forest? Why couldn't it just avoid detection? What if the population is small? What, if, what about all the animals in, you know, the rainforest that we don't really know about? Why can't Bigfoot kind of be one of those? You know, apes are smart. They like to avoid people. They hide. They bury their dead. And for the Loch Ness Monster, you're like, well, maybe it's a dinosaur. The coelacanth was real. That was a prehistoric fish we discovered. We discovered that giant squids were real, even though we thought they weren't, or a variety of sea creatures that we didn't think were real that turned out to be real, so why can't that be true? Another issue is that it comes to these creatures live in an area that is impossible to fully scan. One of them being the Pacific Northwest, where it's just an enormous area, about half the size of the United States, and you can't put cameras on every tree in the Pacific Northwest because you'd need to put up a billion cameras and study the footage all the time, and you can't have hundreds of thousands of people combing through the forest looking for big feats. Same kind of thing with Loch Ness. Loch Ness is a very deep lake at just under 800 feet deep, though keep in mind that is by far not the deepest. The deepest lake in the world is like Baikal in Russia at like 2,500 feet, but it's deep and because there's a lot of peat vegetation and mud, it's one of the least clear lakes on the planet, so you can basically see nothing after like two or three feet. So there's no underwater photography, there's a bunch of crud at the bottom, so sonar is kind of difficult to do, and it's really difficult to see into that muddy water, so you can't scan these areas, and this type of skeptical argument leads into one that becomes theological. It's sort of like, well, you can't scan 
scan the whole lake or you can't scan the whole forest so you really don't know what's there and that logic can lead to proof of existence of God because you can't disprove God. You can't say that God isn't real, therefore he is. Or you can't say that you can't disprove magic. You can't use science to concretely, 100%, without a shadow of a doubt, say that magic cannot be real, therefore it is real. But that second jump of logic is the dangerous one because, you know, magic doesn't have to be real for everything else to function. Everything else functions fine without magic, so therefore magic doesn't have to be real to fill in the gaps because there's no gaps to fill in. And it's kind of the crazy logic that uh, atheists tend to use. It's like, well, the entire universe is governed by a small pink sheep that lives on the dark side of the moon buried deep under the ground. Well, you can't disprove that because we can't really study the dark side of the moon very well, and we certainly can't go mining for very small sheep that live under the ground and test for psychic powers or whatever, and you'll say, yeah, I just, I, I've got nothing on that. I can't disprove that, and the person will say, aha, therefore it's real. I'm like, mm, not quite. Moving along, you've got historical things. Why would Indians lie, or why would a saint lie? If you look at the historical studies of Bigfoot uh, when it comes to Indians, they sort of follow a very different Bigfoot than what we know. It's a wild man myth. It's a myth of the savages that live in the woods, which are most likely humans that were separated from tribes and just kind of lived like hermits or whatever. They probably didn't talk, so they're like less developed than Native Americans, therefore wild men. Or if you read the original account of the saint, Columba, running into the Loch Ness Monster, he commands it to stop attacking a man in the name of Jesus Christ and the monster when he becomes afraid drops the man and swims back into the water. Similarly, there's this fun guy, Mokele Mimbe, who is supposedly a gigantic brontosaurus that lives in Africa and actually one of the most remote parts of Africa that is extraordinarily difficult to access that natives tell stories about for years and the tribes claim to see them and the tribes uh, take people on hunts and adventures to try and get pictures of these things. That picture was obviously fake. But why would these tribes people that have no contact with the outside world lie about a giant dinosaur living in their area? Well, it's because they get visits from foreigners all the time trying to find this thing and foreigners bring in money and food and electronics and nice things to trade with. So it's a very convenient lie for them to keep up. Same kind of way with uh, Bigfoot hunts and lake visits and staying, things like that. An issue with these is that critical thinking like this and reasoning and skepticism aren't always natural. These things we're not born with. Unlike the fear of the unknown, unlike the heuristics of things that are familiar or trusting cameras or not knowing how to rule out the impossible, you have to teach these things. Uh, they take training, practice, right, proper education and testing. Thankfully, the school that I went to was very good at teaching these sort of things. We got a lot of lessons in critical thinking. And for me, when I was a kid, I wanted nothing more than to discover Nessie. I thought I was going to be the guy that set up the perfect trap for this monster. So I got into learning about how radar works. And when I learned something new in school or on the internet about photography, I tried to apply that to learn how photography works. Some of that even applies to like the videos I make today. I learned about zoology, thinking I was going to be a cryptozoologist before I found out that most of those people don't follow the scientific method, which was very disheartening. And investigating people for credibility, which turns out to be quite interesting as most people that take pictures of cryptids take pictures of many, many cryptids, some of which are easily proven hoaxes and some of them not so much and some of them claim to be psychics among other things so yeah uh, my findings when I started digging into this were more than a little bit heartbreaking and I've gone over more of this stuff than any human being ever should have with the final result being that basically all of it's fake basically every photo is a hoax or every eyewitness account is a crazy person or a misidentification with just a handful of outliers out there being what I would call real in air quotes. And those are more like, hmm, that's interesting kind of reels and not more like, oh my God, we have concrete evidence kind of reels. It's more like, well, that's a really interesting thing and this person probably isn't lying, but I don't know what they've managed to find. So moving along when it comes to finding new things or hmm, that's interesting type things before we jump to logical conclusions, conclusions about mythological monsters, you have to ask yourself some hard questions, such as, in an age where cameras are everywhere, it's like cell phones, why are there less photos of aliens and cryptids than ever before? In an age of even better cameras than ever before, why is the quality worse than it was 50 years ago of pictures of monsters and aliens and whatnot? 
why does no government bother putting out warnings or caution signs in these areas? When we can have zoologists that find tiny undiscovered insects in the Amazon and super remote populations of animals that have maybe 50 breeding pairs total, why can't we find these monsters that have millions of dollars of interest brooding around them? When these things die, where do the bodies go? Or where did their poop go? Where did the fur, flipper, spins, skin go? What do they eat for that matter? This is more of a Nessie specific thing. It's really easy to say that big feats can eat almost anything, even human food. But in Loch Ness, there's not a lot of fish and not a lot of food, and you need a lot of food to feed a giant monster like that. Or better yet, where do they fit in in the food chain and the environment? What do they eat? What eats them? How do they relate to the plants, to the water, to the biology? And these kinds of questions need answers. These are the kind of questions that have to be explained when we find new things, which reminds me of one of my favorite stories from uh, Skeptic Magazine. I'm retelling it a bit and paraphrasing, but I think you'll like it. They said that they run Skeptic Magazine, so of course they have a lot of people that disagree with them about a great number of things, we shall say. And one of the more common messages they get is a theory of everything letter or email where a person, a self-proposed physicist, has determined a new theory that unifies gravity and stream theory and general relativity and will explain everything. And these are long and verbose and written out. And generally speaking, they'll, these theories aren't like that bad. They're not that crazy. They'll do like one or two things pretty well and they'll unify like gravity and general relativity in a surprisingly good way. But then when you take those ex theories and extrapolate them and you try to see how does this apply to electricity? How does this apply to magnetism? How does this apply to atomic bonds? How does this apply to ionic lattices and stuff like that? Oh boy, do these ever start falling apart really, really quick because they're designed to prove one specific thing and they don't fit in with the rest of the world as we understand it. So when you learn new things and people are trying to prove new things to you, always keep in mind that these explanations also need to fit in with the rest of the world as we understand it. And if these new things can't explain the rest of the world, but only maybe just one little niche part of it, maybe they're not that accurate. Guys, I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope you enjoyed coming along with me for this kind of crazy ride and this short exercise into critical thinking and skeptical reasoning. If you enjoyed the video, don't forget to like, favorite, and subscribe. Drifter out.